ahead and get started just while um, the rest of the folks are trickling in here. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another session in our professional series. We have a great session planned for you today on defining the next normal and preparing for the future of work with a very special guest from Microsoft Canada. Before we jump in, I just wanna go over some housekeeping. So Michaela, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So throughout the session, any questions you might have, please drop those in the Q&A box and all other comments in the chat, just so we can keep those organized. If you have any tech issues throughout, please send me a private message and I can help you out there. With that being said, I will hand it over to our host, uh, Dave Leahy for introductions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Hannah and Michaela for helping organize this. And we're talking a lot these days about what's coming after COVID. Uh, Canada is ahead of the United States with 74% of our population having the first uh, shot, which is fantastic. And we're talking today with uh, George Sheridan, who's one of the sales gurus at Microsoft. I had the pleasure of working with Jordan when I was at Microsoft. He speaks around the country and throughout the United States on you know, what Microsoft is thinking about the future of work. Uh, they are a very forward-thinking company, always been seen for uh, innovation. Um, much uh, can be learned by uh, copying their business model, frankly, and their stock price is, uh, is doing very well as well. So. Um, We'll be talking a little bit uh, today when we'll make this interactive. Uh, hopefully there's uh, a couple of germs of knowledge that can help you in your business. And I thank you for your hour today. Next slide, please. Um, for those of you who don't know us, some of our new uh, on, this, uh, on this call today, um, we're the largest uh, lead partner of the Predictive Index globally out of uh, Whitby, Ontario, which is just outside of Toronto. Um, our clients use the software from Hire to Inspire um the benefits of using it uh frankly uh we've had our best year ever this year which is uh, uh probably due to the fact that more leaders are looking to understand their employees uh in different ways because uh, COVID has created some remote challenges i was just on a call with a mining uh group about that very thing about hybrid work um and most of the uh uh the leaders that we train are seeing that the analytic approach is a new way of uh, of counseling, mentoring, uh, onboarding employees, as well as hiring them. hiring them. Next slide, please. If you haven't followed Gardner, it's an easy Google. Just put a Google alert in there. It gives us a lot of good ideas as business leaders. But one that came a few months ago uh, was of interest to me and to our clients is that they have studied firms that have uh, brought in predictive analytics models, not just in finance, but in things like human resources uh, with people. And they have shown that the productivity has increased by as much as 20%. So think about that when you're building your business case to go and get more money to train your leaders, your supervisors to be uh, schooled in, in predictive analytics, whether it's the predictive index or another vendor. There is an ROI there, which is becoming significant. Next slide, please. I have the pleasure of introducing Jordan. So uh, I'll whisper, I whispered a few minutes ago about uh, his background, but he is the general manager now for the modern workplace. This is the bio, a great picture of Jordan. He looks like he could run for, uh, for parliament with this picture, Jordan. Um, Jordan has got a, uh, uh, a, a, a long resume, but includes being on the advisory board for the uh, Canadian Professional Sales Association. He is also a founding member of the Microsoft uh, Management Council uh, in Canada. He is uh, famous for being uh, a great boss, a great leader. People like working for him because he creates high performance teams and they win, they're inclusive, and they are accountable. So uh, Jordan, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thanks, Dave. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great. He, you know, I was going through the, the content and uh, just thinking about, uh, about you know, predictive and all the times that we spent on this. And to this day, you know, whenever I'm whenever I'm trying to explain to somebody how an interpersonal interaction really works, I actually find myself drawing out drawing out the four lines of the grid and explaining where people are. And when uh, you know when somebody starts acting a little a little off from where they normally are, I, I always remember some of the some of the lessons around you know where people snap to in times of stress. So I mean, I I know those are just two very very small examples of the the value of the system, but. Uh, you know, I, I can't stress enough just how literally it's been what 10 plus years for me. And there, 
you know, on a weekly basis, I, I find a use for uh, for the things that I've learned uh, being a being a, a trained practitioner myself once upon a time. So, um, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to uh, to talk to the team today. Um, if thank you for the the flip, you can you can go to the next slide. Um, one of the things that I'll, I'll start with is just sharing. Um, there's there's a lot a lot of a lot of really good information coming out right now, and very broad based information uh, about what we're learning. You know, now that we're uh, here, we are what 15, 16 months, I guess, into into what we would have called the global pandemic. Um, and you know, as we as we start to see light at the end of the tunnel and see vaccinations really picking up, as as Dave. Uh, as Dave alluded to, um, I just got my my second uh, vaccination the other day. Um, I can confirm, by the way, that the AstraZeneca Go Gen X, followed by Pfizer, was exactly the experience it was described as, as in don't make any plans for about 24 hours, <laughs> but uh, but uh, all all good all good 24 hours later, and um, it's it's really really encouraging to see. Um, to see the, the, the percentages go up and to see a light start to emerge at the end of the tunnel. Um, one, of the, one of the studies that's been done is this work trend index that we released and uh, we'll provide a link to the, to the full uh, website that has all of that data on it uh, at the end. Um, but we went out and asked, uh, asked a, a lot of people across the, well, 30,000 people in fact, across 31 countries, uh, Canada included, and there is specific Canadian data, which I think is important. Um, you know, to, to just learn a little bit about some of the trends and to try to get some data data driven insights. And the reason that I say that, you know, the Canadian specific data is important is obviously we like to have, you know, Canadian specific data, but it's also important because one of the things that we're learning as we think about the return to work and as we think about the impact that the pandemic has had on people and you start to see the emergence of this thing called hybrid is that the way that hybrid and the return to work and what the new normal will emerge as is itself emerging as highly country and highly culturally specific. You know, we have, we have countries around the world that have, been, that have been reopening in different stages for the last little while. And we see wildly different participation, you know, in thinking about, you know, do people go back to the office three plus days of the week or not? Um, in some countries, we see it up at, you know, 70, 80%. In other countries, we see it at 20 or 30%. So I think the more data that we can gather that is very specific to the country and the culture that we're in, I think the more, the more informed we can be and, the, you know, hopefully the better decisions we can make. Uh, over to the next slide, please. Um, so, I mean, as I, I said to that, uh, you know, 2020 obviously did change work forever. We started at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, well, just, just prior to that, we had been talking about this phrase about the new world of work. And our, our emphasis was all around the intersection of, you know, people and places. And, you know, did we need to create different kinds of office spaces because people were tired of sitting in cubicles and being in the gopher farm and they wanted open spaces and they wanted different kinds of workspaces depending on the work that we were doing. Um, once the, you know, once the lockdown started, the, the early conversation was very much around, okay, when will we return back to normal? When will we go back to where we were? When will we resume what we were doing? And I think, as, as I mentioned, what we quickly learned and what the data now supports very, very deeply is that we will not go back to, to where we were. We've learned so much. We've learned so much that's very valuable. We've learned about what people value We've, uh, people have been very vocal about what they look for in an employer, what they look for in an employment experience. And all that comes into, that's all captured here in this work trend index, but it all comes into this concept of a hybrid model where you know, some employees will return to the workplace, some will continue to work from home. Um, you know, people that, that can go into the office you know, may go in once a week versus four or five times a week previously. So we can take everything that we've learned and we can now incorporate that into how we're planning and how we're uh, how we're thinking about the the hybrid workforce going forward. I think it's back over to you, Dave. So, what's ahead for us? Next slide, please. One of the wake-up calls that we're seeing is that um, people are quitting and they're not going back to the office that they were 
forced to go back. They're just saying adios and, and they're leaving and going to a ju- different jurisdiction. <coughs> Excuse me. In the United States, more people are quitting the jobs than ever before. So the struggle is, you know, how do companies keep up? Um, one of the focuses is, you know, the leaders and who are the leaders today? Who are your, bo- your bosses and supervisors? Because if they are not leading from the world of the employee, it's going to be the biggest challenge you've ever had for retaining employees. COVID vaccine has prevented, uh, or the COVID challenge has prevented a lot of your employees from putting their resumes on the street. The use now of technology, the use of technology like Zoom or GoToMeeting or Microsoft uh, Meetups has made an interview uh, only an hour. It doesn't take half a day anymore. They can interview with a new employer very quickly on your nickel without even uh, any alarm bells being set off. So this is a wake up call for leaders and the need for management to say the slight risk of talent is more accentuated than ever before. Next slide, please. Now you have leaders like uh, David Solomon, the new CEO of Goldman Sachs saying that, you know, only his best employees or the eager employees, you know, uh, are are the ones that, that come to work each day, the ones that show up in the office. And that's got some heat and that's got some press and, and some feedback because that was really a silly statement. But a lot of executives, senior executives, believe that, you know, if you're not in the office, you're not producing. If you're not in the office, you're not networking. And we believe that's not entirely true. We also believe that the commuting times has hurt innovation, and innovation has been heightened during COVID. And this article supports that. So companies should adopt a hybrid model, and they should keep this commuting uh, strategy in the back of their people plans, because you're saving people an hour, an hour and a half a day of stress has had an impact and does have an impact on their ability to innovate. Their, their innovative abilities are reduced, as this study points out, by long commute times. That challenges companies for productivity, and that is something that we're now aware of, but we should have always been aware of. Next slide, please. As we come out of COVID, many companies, the restaurants, have, it's so great to see the restaurants in Toronto starting to, to ramp up again. Um, sales are now going to start to to become increasing. I mean, there's one restaurant who said to me, my sales are up 500% over the last year. Well, you know, last year he was closed and this year he's got a drive through uh, opportunity. Um, we're gonna see workforce cuts. We're gonna see outsourcing of certain roles. Um, do you need accounting? Can you outsource accounting? Um, do you need accounts receivable? Can you outsource accounts receivable? Um, it's all uh, uh, up for grabs these days. Um, We're going to see changing ways of work. Um, Can people work part-time? Do you need uh, everybody full-time? Do you need more contract workers? We're going to see um, a real struggle to keep clients. You know, and the reason being is that the world has changed. Supplier has changed. Maybe I'm not going to be the same type of business as I was before. Um, And as we focus on this recovery, all companies, it's going to be putting more pressure on the existing staff. More um, time will be needed to coach them and mentor them, but how do I find that time when I'm struggling, um, when I'm struggling to keep my employees engaged? Um, low morale is something we see a lot. We have now a new predictive index in, engagement survey, and the, state, the, the statistics we're seeing out of that is, is showing us a large amount of employees are disenfranchised and disengaged with the existing model. So what are you going to do on this? And as you focus on the the, the challenge ahead, um, you know what what do we what do we need to gravitate to? We need to gravitate to science. We need to gravitate to some type of statistical way um, to map out a path to recovery. And this this frozen workforce that's going to unfreeze this September as we go back to work. Our office is opening up in September first, by the way. Many others are opening earlier, some later. Um, there's going to be a misalignment of talent, but there's also going to be a heightened need for analytics. And that's where we see the use of predictive analytics at the floor level, at the supervisor level, 
at the store manager level and not just in the HR level. And that additional data is going to be a real accelerator for people placement, for conflict resolution, for onboarding in remote environments like Zoom, and also for having some difficult discussions about uh, terminations uh, or replacements. Next slide, please. The statistics out there are also showing, these are US statistics, very similar in Canada, is that the uh, labor force, the amount of labor that's available to us is really at a long time, at an all time low, and it probably will last for years. Our immigration rate was reduced in Canada due to COVID substantially. You know, hopefully we ramp that back up because we don't have enough people for jobs. It is creating a drain. It is creating all kinds of people challenges uh, in many, many roles. Next slide. Full employment, we know from our economics is that's 5%. So it's always 5% of the population that is looking for work. Pre-COVID, we were just about there and we're heading back towards that very, very quickly. So these two pressures, not enough labor and unemployment rates at full employment are putting more pressure on the leader, the supervisor, the company to keep people that we have engaged and keep a recipe or, or establish a recipe to manage from the world of the employee. You're going to see a shift of power to the employee versus the employer uh, in a very rapid pace in the next 12 to 24 months. The trend that we predict will put pressure on supervisors to become better bosses, to seek better coaching, to seek better counseling, to seek better analytics, uh, to seek more of a pattern that helps them become a, what we call, or what I call in my book, a best boss. Next slide, please. Thoughts that's needed as we get through this is pre-COVID, we had a bunch of people in the red line here that you know had a job, you know, I had to make a payment on the Mercedes or the BMW or whatever they're driving. I had to make a mortgage payment. Um, may not have been fully engaged. Um, now they'll have choices to leave that job that was not a great fit for them and then move on to something else. The new companies or the companies that are bringing people in ideally want to get the candidate that just fits the job. You know, the personality that fits what we call the JA or job assessment. And when we do that from the start, we have what's called a talent optimized company. We have the talent, which has the right behavioral and, and cognitive agility to do the role at the start being onboarded properly. That information is shared with the manager, the hiring manager, so she can manage that person from that world of the employee. And that creates a culture that is more engaged. When we put that together, that creates teams that are jiving together better. People fit their jobs. We have less of the, what we call chair spinners. People at five o'clock, their chair is spinning so fast that they run out the door because they just didn't like their job. So this is where we look at analytics you know, down the road or today and bringing people in from higher to inspire because they just fit the role like a glove. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Many of, the, of our clients know that there are three different things when we're bringing people in to an organization. The resume is no better than a coin toss. The briefcase is their knowledge, skills, and intelligence. And, and in, a, in a full uh, environment where labor is short and unemployment is full, you may not have people with the exact skills you need going forward. How do you accommodate for that? Well, the future will tell us, or the, the, the sauce will tell us, or the strategy would tell us, is that you would look for people with a higher cognitive agility, and you can teach them the skills uh, that they are needed in your specific industry. Performance comes when we have the, the, the behavioral drives their cognitive agility, the uh, resume understood and references are checked, and then the coach or the leader 
takes their passions, the values of the organization, their shared beliefs, and coaches from their world and work with the employee so that I'm listening to the employee. The employee is being heard based on her or his personality style, and we can get the job to be done uh, completed in a, in, a, in a much more enriched and a higher performing nature. Next slide, please. A thought that we uh, have with our clients when we're brought in for consulting gigs, a lot of times we're brought in to help on a, a change management group where there's a, a group or an area that's not performing particularly well. When we go into a four box model, where we look at uh, in the top right corner, who are your cultural champions? The ones that have the highest engagement scores. And of course we have now a PI engagement survey that we can offer or the company has their own engagement survey. And what's their performance like? And from our statistics, more often than not, the cultural champions, their predictive index behavior PI matches the job model very closely and the cognitive is in the range and the manager leader is managing that information from that world of that employee. This is Nirvana. And the opposite side, when we look at organizations in a COVID world or a post COVID world, you are always going to have some, hopefully not a lot of the contaminators, folks that are disengaged and their performance is not where it should be. Well, as our friends at Ikea say, let's promote them to customer, which is a friendly way of saying, you know, we'll make them go away. Oftentimes, when we look at contaminators, their PI does not match, does not match the model. It does not match the cognitive model and or the boss is frustrated because he or she doesn't know what to do. Well, you hired them. Someone hired them for the role. Either they were hired correctly for the talent optimized plan or they were hired because maybe they're a friend of someone. But the right thing to do is set people up for success. And if they don't fit, you know, you, you really are not doing them any favors by keeping them in that role and releasing them will be the best thing. The other side of what we call the toxic people is an opportunity to let's get better. You know, someone who is engaged because you're paying them well but their performance is not where it should be. The root cause there in all of our studies is the manager leader. Is the manager leader the right leader? Is she too brisk? Is he too direct? Does he need coaching? Does he need replacing? So those silent killers with the right environment can be moved over into the higher performing group. And the bottom ones are the ones that are the biggest opportunity, the grinders. These are the people that are performing well, but their engagement scores are poorly, are, are poor. Well, what's the root cause? They may have been passed over for a promotion. They may have uh, been set up for success in a remote environment, and now you're forcing them back to the office. If they're a low B, they hate that. So why would you do that? That'll be a drain on performance. So when you think of the four box model with your teams, it's very easy to do. You have people, you may hunch them, get the PIs, they match the job model, trying to make someone fit, and it's a zero, you know, a zero percent fit, uh, what is the right thing to do? Can they be promoted to another part of the organization, or should they uh, be, be carefully uh, exited? And that culture killer uh, strategy or culture maker will be so important because the companies that are recruiting now, the employees are Googling you and looking through your Glassdoor rating. And if you have bad bosses, they'll show up in the Glassdoor rating. That kills your culture and that kills your brand. And it makes it very hard for you to recruit in the, in the, in the years and the months ahead. Next slide, please. I said earlier, the power is in the employee. So the analytics give you an approach to them. Jordan's been trained in PI, so he knows what I'm talking about. And many of you on this call also have been, but some have not. So here are three employees. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. But if you have someone who is a maverick, high assertiveness, high extroversion, very impatient, and really doesn't care about the, the details, they are a change agent. They are innovative thinkers. 
They are going to be undaunted by risk and failure. And if you put them in a cubicle, crunching data and financial reports, shame on you. They're not going to stay. They're not going to do great work. You may be keeping them short term because you're paying them well, but they have the power to lead. They have the power of saying, hey, this doesn't match who I am, and they will leave. Joseph is another example of a specialist. You see so many of these specialists in COVID forced to be having their cameras on in Zoom. Well, that's not what a lobby likes. A lobby is very reserved. A lobby wants to be reserved for rewarded for technical expertise. Are you rewarding the lobby for technical expertise? And are you rewarding them as a team versus an individual? If you don't tie in your rewards and recognition to the world of the employee, they also can become flight risks because there are more choices out there for them. Ryan, at the bottom, the classic project manager, the controller, they will do very high quality detailed work. Give them a project, let them manage it. Too many supervisors have people like Ryan working for them, high A's, and then all of a sudden they're micromanaging them. That's like taking a racehorse and pulling the reins back all day long. Well, that racehorse will get frustrated and eventually leave. The whole strategy with the employee empowerment is the DNA of their PI gives you a roadmap of how to manage them, gives you a roadmap of what they like to do, and gives you a roadmap of how to manage and coach them going forward. Next slide, please. Back to you, Jordan. Tons of tons of great information there, and I was I was sitting there thinking of my own profile as you, as you were going through it, and uh, it, it it is also remarkable how how little that profile does change over time. You you adapt here and there, you may manifest differently, but I can tell you my my profiles remained fairly consistent, deeply consistent actually for again ten plus years now. Um, one of the things that, that this study touched on, and I think that, that we really need to be aware of to take into account some of what Dave just said is that leaders are out of touch with their employees. And that's a, that's a fairly startling statement if you happen to be a leader and you look and you say, whoa, what is, what is this saying? 53% of the leaders in the study said that they're thriving right now. And yet it was about 15 points lower than that that's at, um, for, for the folks that don't have decision-making authority. Uh, leaders said they're building stronger relationships with their colleagues, the, with their leadership teams, they're earning higher incomes, they're taking all of their vacation days. You know, according to the study, leadership during a pandemic sounds like a fairly, fairly good place to be. Um, and when I think about, you know, my own leadership team and the culture that we've created to try to get through all of this, it's really easy to see how that becomes apparent. You know, for example, we started, I, I have uh, nine people that report to me. Each of them have, have a team of people that report to them. And we started at the beginning of, of the pandemic and said, hey, let's get together for coffee every morning, just because we were all missing the in-person interaction. Well, that tradition stayed through to this day and we have coffee five days a week on the calendar. It's, you know, sometimes it's four people attending, sometimes it's seven, sometimes it's two, it's total drop-in. Um, but we as leaders created that connection and I know that the, the team has given me the feedback that says they feel like we're closer than ever as a leadership team because of it, because that's a place where we very specifically don't talk about work. We talk about the news, we talk about sports, we talk about current events, whatever it may be, but it's a place where you can bond together as a team. So it's, I, I, I believe these statistics to be true. And I can tell you, it's, I'm sure with many of you that are on the call today, it, you don't have to look far to see where in your own organizations you could see these patterns emerging. Next slide, please. The, the thing that this really drives is making sure that we as leaders are showing the empathy that, that our employees expect. And it's not only the empathy, but it's, it's staying in touch as the first slide would have indicated and making sure that we actually understand the experience and the unique challenges that they're going through. You know, are leaders too narrowly focused on where to invest? You know, they, they, the study showed, for example, that 42% of employees say they lack office essentials. You know, are we getting monitors out there? Are we getting them the right desk chairs? Are we getting them the supplies they need in order to do their jobs? Um, so, you know, thinking, thinking about some of the ways that we can double down and really help ensure that we are connecting is by embracing that hybrid model, which you'll hear come back into play every, every time we talk about this. You know, 
we're giving employees the flexibility to work when they want to and where they want to, are we embracing that from a tools, from a processes and from a culture standpoint? Are we getting them the technology they need in order to be able to actually work when they want, wherever they want? Are we setting cultural parameters? For example, you'll see people with little tags in their, in their email signatures now that says, you know, I've adjusted my working schedule to affect my unique needs. Please don't feel the need to adjust yours accordingly. So when they're sending out an email at 8 p.m., for example, it's that, that permission to say, hey, just because I'm sending it, it's because I might have started work today at 11 because that's what I needed to do with my kids being homeschooled, for example. So those enabling those the technology so that they can actually fulfill that, mission, that, that vision, as well as making sure that as leaders, we're very in touch with the culture that we're perpetuating can really help bring us back closer in touch with our employees. Gen Z, uh, talking specifically about the, the generation that is born uh, 1997 to 2012, 2015. The study really, I think the, the background on this slide is, is perfect because it's a, it's, a it's a bit of an alarm. Um, you know, Gen Z is the one that's, that's mostly at risk. Um, you know, we've, we joke even though it's no joking matter. And that's, that's because the, as you go into the, into the generations that have been working longer, well, the, you know, myself as a pretty squarely Gen X, I don't miss commuting. <laughs> I, I did the drive, I live in Guelph. I did the drive from Guelph to either Mississauga or downtown Toronto most days for 25 years. I'm, you know, I miss, I miss the personal interaction. I miss a lot of the elements that, that gave me energy, but I very quickly found other ways to gain that energy and ones that I was quite happy didn't involve, you know, the, the commute, for example. And there's a lot that's out in current studies about the commute as one major element of this. It was one that just came out um, that Angus Reid did for Canada the other day. Um, and it said that a very high percentage of Canadians would be willing to commute again, as long as their commute was less than either 30 or 15 minutes. And if you think about the commutes that we all know and love and have experienced, how many can you name that were 15 minutes or less? Not very many, 30, again, you're, you're, you're cutting down to a very small segment of the population. So it really does drive the need. But back to Gen Z, you know, this, this generation is the one that it shows, I think because of some of these elements, because of the highly interactive nature that they're used to, because of the, the collaborative nature of the working together in the office spaces and those collaborative spaces that we'd been building, they were so used to, they're the ones that are just merely surviving right now. They're the ones that are, or, or even worse, they're the ones that are, that are flat out struggling. Um, and that, that's something, that's a generation where we need to put you know, a lot of emphasis and think about what are we truly doing that adapts to their needs, not just the, the needs of the other generations, many of which the Gen Xers and the millennials are, are, are part of. Next slide, please. So Dave, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how to manage the Gen Zs. So thanks, Jordan. And, and it is, uh, you know, a multi-generational workplace. And so we're not picking on anyone, but uh, here's an example of how you can use analytics and tie it into one area. And so what we're finding, and we hire a few of these Gen Z, uh, uh, you know, each year, is that it's just a little different. Um, you know, we have uh, one uh, on this call, and, uh, and Michaela's volunteered to be the guinea pig on this call. So thank you, Michaela, for, for, for joining us today. But when we work with this group, um, they are uh, a little bit different. Um, keeping a pulse on them is a little bit different. Um, I remember uh, one we hired a few years ago, I won't tell you his name, but his mother called and uh, suggested that he come for an interview. Um, I took the interview because it was recommended through a friend and he became a great uh, intern and then um, a valued employee. Um, but his mother wanted a check-in call believe it or not. And I thought that was kind of different. And I said, let's try this. So I gave a mother a check-in call, you know, once a quarter, which was not with any other employee that we had. Um, but it really worked. The, kid, the uh, individual became a great employee uh, with us. Um, this generation certainly wants to be managed from their world, their drive. They want to be understood uniquely. And the predictive index uh, is ideal for that. Uh, it is cool data. The millennials tell me they love the emojis on the PI. Um, so I guess we're just fortunate that our algorithm 
is more involved with this generation than perhaps others because it's cool. Uh, there's even a PI app now that they can use, um, which, is, which is neat. But the whole idea is they grew up with technology. They, always, they grew up with an always-on kind of uh, mentality. Um, and, and, you know, uh, as a, a result of that, they really want instant coaching. Uh, coach them in real time, correct them in real time, um, and it seems to work. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the strategies with managing the gen uh, that and other generations really now is taking the second survey, which you know I call it the uh, the new sister to PI, the cognitive assessment or or what we call CA, and look at the cognitive agility of that employee. You know, you'll have an employee, a, a Gen Z or any employee, the, the cognitive survey runs, as we all know, from 100 to 450, where you would not manage a 110 the same way as you'd manage a 375 cog. Average score is 200. So, you know, if you've got a cognitive that is 275, you better give them more challenges because they'll get bored. And they want new challenges, and they want to have the, you know ideas to prove their intellectual uh, capacity. But if you've got a cog and it's a 150, if you overwhelm them with information too quickly, uh, the burnout is going to be there, and they won't be effective employees. So mapping the learning style to the cognitive is very important. I like to call the cognitive as a predictive learning indicator. And it's either extended with a law with a lower PI cognitive, the learning journey will be extended. That means multiple meetings, set it especially up for them in Outlook. Or if it's a higher cog, the meetings will be short drive-bys um, and maybe not as frequent. So this ability to learn is measured now by the cognitive survey, and it is very helpful in managing any generation, but particularly the Gen Z group. Next slide, please. And here's my guinea pig for today. So Michaela, thank you for volunteering. Don't you want to come off mute? Um, I know you hate when I surprise you, but this is uh, a new millennial that we brought in. Um, I've never met her. I don't think I've met you in person, have I, Michaela? No, not yet. <laughs> All right. She's been with us a few months, and she's a rock star. She's doing very well. You see her cognitive is, is ahead of our model. Her uh, PI is what perfect for client service, so low assertiveness, high extroversion. The C rate on the line, so she can work fast or slow, depending on the project that we give her. And she's detailed as we need to. And then what I really love about the... Uh, the PIM score is that it's very high, an M82, so she can keep up to the pace of our high growth company. And, and it's, this model allows her to be set up for success with shared services. I also took it as a special project, although she has her own direct supervisor, to give her direct feedback. How is that being received so far, Michaela? I think Dave is right on point when I think us Gen Zs like a lot of coaching because I think he did mention that we have a lot of coddling from our parents. So that direct um, feedback that I get constantly from Dave, I think it pushes me to be better. And the PI has um, given him the knowledge needed so that he knows what kind of feedback to give me and how to say it to me. Um, just because I've worked at other places and I know that like blanket coaching is a thing. And, but with PI, you know how to directly communicate with someone according to their style and what they need. And then Jordan, when you and I first started at Microsoft, I'm dating myself, but that was in the 90s. That was not a style that was very custom back then, right? No, not, not at all, not at all. I mean, we've, we've adapted to more of a, what we call a model coach care framework today, but uh, cer certainly back then, no, like ideas of that and situational leadership were, were kind of unheard of. And I mean, that's, that's the genesis of where we, where we had you know, begun working with PI in the first place. So that model coach care strategy is a salient point, I think with all employees, and that's going to become more important in the next 12 to 24 months. So the, the, we keep coming back to the, the job of the future uh, is going to be more centered on 
do my managers coach well? Do they are they equipped to coach well? And do they coach from the world of the employee? Uh, thanks, Michaela. Next slide, please. So, in your uh, software, many of your clients, and if not, we'll get these to anybody here who's not today. Um, first time managers, they need some assistance. Right in the software now, there are management reports called MDCs or management development reports, specifically designed with the AI technology and PI for each employee. We also know by generation, certain um, groups need more praise and support and extra um, uh, coddling, if you will. Well, this report helps us there. It highlights their strengths and it also highlights some blind spots and it also can be used for uh, conflict resolution. So it's pretty cool uh, career development uh, vehicle. It's called the Management Development Report based on their PI. Next slide, please. Back to you, Jordan. Thanks. So talking about talent, and I want to be cognizant of time here, but um, you can flip to the next slide. One of the things the study uh, tells us is something that we have seen loud and clear uh, in some of the some of the hiring patterns and, and uh, response patterns that we've seen from prospective employees over the last year. Um, remote opportunities and the ability to to be doing a, an opportunity remotely really has opened things up for what we would call diverse applicants. Think about on, on LinkedIn, women, Gen Z, those without a graduate degree they show up very clearly as being more likely to apply for remote positions. What we've also seen, and I don't wanna take away from too much of what, what Dave will say next, is that we need to actually ad adopt our culture for that as well. Like we are very fixed in this mindset of, you know, in my business, it's national. So I have a Western region, I have a central region, I have an Eastern region. And, you know, we have for 25 years tried to put people in those regions because that's where they'll be dealing with the customers. What, what hybrid is, is teaching us is that we can expand out and if we write the job descriptions, et cetera, correctly, which I know Dave's gonna talk about, we can make it palatable so that as long as time zones aren't too crazy or people can make that decision, we can have jobs done from anywhere in the country. And what we've seen is, is literally, we just hired a number of roles for a new team that we created we saw 10x the number of applications to those roles than we would normally see for a role of a similar type. And they were from across uh, the, the, the spectrum of the country. So I think it really is working that if you can, if you can get the job descriptions and, and the, uh, the culture right, uh, hybrid really does open up a whole range of, uh, of opportunities that we as employers haven't really had access to before. I think Dave, back to you to talk more about that. Dave, you're muted. Thanks, Jordan. The, the, the software that now is created for us has got an emoji range in it and the JA report, which has all been redeveloped for the world that we're working in today, has recommended profile or emoji for the top of it. Has a printout that can be very quickly cut and paste and put into Indeed or any medium that you've got is based on the predictive index survey, which is going to the drives that you're looking for in the specific role and be tied into cognitive as well. And this now is being used by companies to attract clients that are a better fit. They have fewer applicants, but people that fit the role. Now they may not have a university or college diploma but if they have the right cognitive and the right behavior, there's a higher degree of success from our experience. Four years ago, we had an opening in our Quebec region. We had a candidate apply from the hospitality sector. It was Martin Foster. He did not, he had everything right, the PI, the cognitive fit, but he did not have a university degree at two-year college. We brought him in and he's been a rock star. We've coached him properly. We onboarded him properly. He's grown sales year over year, over 20% per year in the last four years. And so does that role necessarily need a university degree? 
there's been a lot of thinking in the United States of not recruiting people from Harvard, Yale, and all the Ivies, but from B schools and C schools based on looking at analytics and looking at the probability of being success versus just getting into the right school. So something to think about when we're attracting people and screening people. Next slide, please. The entrance of Dream Team software, this is something that our talent optimization suite in Boston has created. It's very interesting when we look at teams in the four quadrant model. And Jordan, this is new since last we spoke. But we can take a team and we can look at who are the innovators, top right corner. These are people that have high levels of assertiveness and great sense of proactivity. There are certain profiles like that. We can take people that are results and discipline organized. These are people that are high assertive, high detail people, and very technical project manager types. We can take a look at the team and say, do I have people that will just get stuff done? Very detailed, very sequential, and follow the rules, bottom left corner. In the top left corner, we have people that are the team builders, people that you know are very collaborative. We can now put the, the PIs into a, the quadrant through the team, Dream Team software, which is called Dream, Team Discovery, and look for gaps. Next slide, please. When we look at this slide, we see there's a gap. A gap is telling us that, in this case, we don't have enough innovators in this team. We don't have enough people that are process-driven on this team. That creates a, a risk for us, and so now, when we're recruiting for talent, <clears throat> we now have an alignment between HR and the business team to go after people that fit this, this uh, category. They still have to have the right cognitive agility. They still have to have, of course, you know, the right uh, PI. But now we have uh, a target that is more focused on cultivating uh, a higher performing team. Next slide, please. As we come out of this, and we've just got 10 minutes left, Jordan, as we close, I could talk all day on this. But what does the future of work look like? The future is a series of teams that are either remote or hybrid or on-site that are well-planned, that have job models that are structurally done with input from the line managers and the HR business partners, if they are close to the role, that are using AI technology, which is in PI now, to map the person to the role, both behaviorally and cognitively, and then are focusing on the boss leader. Who are they? Are they the right people? Do they have the right skill sets? Are they analytically prepared so they can coach with insight or caring or mentoring? And are the people that are not performing in the right role? Maybe it's time to make some changes. Maybe it's time to promote some that are not doing well to customer. Back to you, Jordan, to wrap up. Okay, so think if you can flip to the next slide, please. Thinking about the employee experience, um, it's, uh, it, it won't be a surprise to hear one of the major areas that we're, we're moving into as far as the software development is concerned. Um, you know, employers really do need to rethink the overall employee experience. We need to be able to compete for the best and most diverse talent. We need to make sure more than ever that we have a pulse on that talent and that we're really putting in place the elements, uh, whether they be cultural, technological, that intersection of sort of people, place and process that, our, that employees are looking for because more than ever, we know that they are prone to leave. And there's some stats that, that we, we will share about that. You know, this includes hiring, it includes onboarding, overall employee well-being. Do we care about growth? Do we care about retention? And thinking about the overall platforms that will allow, enable that. So I, I won't turn this into a product pitch, but you, you will see that we have a, a whole set of solutions that have just come out literally called an employee experience platform. And what it's meant to do is bring all of the major elements, you know, topics, knowledge, learnings, et cetera, all into one common place where people spend the majority of their time, but do it in a way that is highly tailored for them so that we as leaders can capitalize on the knowledge that, that we're gaining. For example, you know, insights. I can click on an insights tab and get some really interesting information, anonymized and private, of course, about the trends that I'm seeing within the team. 
Am I seeing the collaboration occur between members of the team? How are the after hours working uh, males going? You know, how much time are they spending on the on calls during the week versus having focus time to actually think about strategizing on the business? You can start to gain insight into the employee experience and really, really be able to take targeted action, which is super important when we think about being in constant competition for, for the best talent out there. Next slide, please. What's at, what's at stake is, is what I just talked about. So we'll go to the next slide. You think about it, 41%, the study told us, of the global workforce is likely to consider leaving their current employer within the next year. Actually, we're seeing a very else, interesting stat also emerge, which is a very high percentage of people are considering just not going back to work at all. But that's a whole other conversation. This number is much higher for Gen Z, 54%, and 46 are planning to make a major, major pivot or career transition. So what has the last year and a half taught us? and the emergence of hybrid and what people can do. I think it's taught us a number of things. One of them is that people are far more mobile than they thought before, partially because location has become unlocked, partially because they've learned to value elements like the cultural elements of an employer, like whether they're, that employer truly does take care of their well-being and provide them with the tools, et cetera, that they need for a positive experience. And if they're not finding those things, people are more likely to leave. And as the generations, which we'd already been seeing, as you get into the, the younger generations, they're the ones that are most likely to make that switch because they're less invested in where they are and they are more invested in having the experience that they're looking for. Next slide. So as we wrap up today, and uh, we're almost there, and thank you for, for joining us. Think about your people and your brands. You know, what are your current glass door ratings? If you haven't checked them, you should be all over that. The best companies that we're working with are monitoring this. And look, most of the comments that are of a, of a, of a negative uh, slant for companies are, fo are focused on the supervisor boss experience. So are you equipping your supervisors to be the best supervisors they can be? Are you putting the tools in place for them to leverage technology? Uh, we love the Office 365 from Microsoft. Jordan, it's uh, our standard. And all of our managers have access to all of that suite, which is you know, helpful for them. We also work with clients in real time you know, with technology to look at the PI. And the PI, before we have a discussion about you know, a manager or an employee, we look at the boss's PI. And we look to this to see uh, where that's taking us. So are, are your people technically uh, uh, strong. The future will, will demand that they are leveraging analytics like PI um, to be better bosses and leveraging cognitive to be better supervisors. Next slide, please. As we wrap up, uh, Jordan, back to you, and then we'll go for a couple of questions. Thank you. So, I mean, I, I think we've, we've said it all here. We can wrap quickly, but I mean, some of the things the work trend has showed us is first of all, we, we can't think about things as we've traditionally thought about them, whether it's notions of space and time when it comes to how, when, and where we work, whether it's the flexibility in terms of, of the, the tools that people use or how they engage the hours that they do it in. We've got to think differently and we've got to adapt the processes that we have in place uh, in order to, to reflect the hybrid work culture that's emerging and, the, and frankly, the demands that employees will have to be able to have a hybrid work culture in the future. You know, you need to think about a plan that really does put people at the center. Yes, there's a places element. Yes, there's a processes element. And all of your processes really do need to be rethought with hybrid in mind. But people absolutely need to be at the center because they are the first thing that will react if there is not a, a recognition of hybrid in place. And we need to th really think about, you know, back to our model coach care. Um, we, we actually, you hear this phrase a lot our leadership team holds each other accountable and they say, what are you modeling right now? You know, when I'm, when I'm sending emails 24 hours a day, when I'm not taking vacation, when, you know, when I'm actually on vacation, but I'm constantly on email and the team knows it, um, you know, really thinking about, are we leading the way and leading by example and modeling how to avoid digital exhaustion, how to make sure that well-being is, is important and critical um, and creating the culture that ultimately embraces all of those things with, you know, with the breaks, the wellness, the boundaries, and really recognizing that the physical world that we, that we were in for so long 
had those things built into it in ways that we just didn't know. You got up from your desk, you went for a quick walk, you went to the washroom, you grabbed a coffee, you ran into people when you had coffee, you went to a cafeteria or a restaurant to have lunch. Those were all things that were part of a day that we really need to think about how we're recreating in a largely virtual world or a hybrid world going forward, where a large percentage of our workforce will still be experiencing collaboration and communication that way. So thank you, Jordan. And I love that model coach care. I think that's uh, it's so apropos for today's world. Love to see that Microsoft uh, is continuing and, uh, and innovating and hopefully today People have saw that this uh, this world of analytics is, you know, outside of HR and, and now really should be at the hands of the supervisors. Um, Hannah, back to you for uh, for any questions, and then we'll wrap up. Sure. All right. Well, thank you both for a great conversation today. Just in the interest of time, we do have a, a really good question here. I think you both can uh, answer. So. What is your advice or opinion on creating a plan to go back to the office where flexibility wasn't the norm pre-pandemic? How do you manage employee expectations? And maybe for you, Dave, after Jordan uh, does his take on that, how do you see a tool like PI being helpful for managing a flexible working team? Jordan, you want to start and then I'll finish? Sure. Um, I, I think, I mean, that, that's exactly what what we have done, or at least we're in the process of doing, and I'll say data driven is something that you will hear us mention very often. We've tried to be as close to the pulse of what our employees want as possible and make sure that we're communicating any plans that we are developing that align to the data that we've gathered. For example, we announced a few months ago, actually, that, you know, going forward, any Microsoft employee anywhere in the world can work from home at least 50% of the time. Don't even ask anybody, just do it. Um, and we, we put out like literally a series of guidelines on what remote work at the time is what we were calling it could look like for people. We share the data that we've been collecting on what people want and what they value in order to, to create that plan. I think you'll see as, as we get into, especially here in Canada, offices opening, you know, hopefully later in the year, early next year. I think being very specific about the guidelines that we're doing and under, making sure that we're communicating um, the, uh, you know, the local laws and health regulations that we're adhering to as we're doing it. But more importantly, I think it comes back to hybrid and that's making sure that we are creating an environment where people understand that the inclusive work environment that we've been forced to create because of the pandemic over the last 15 months is one that will continue when some of the workforce is back in a physical location and some of the workforce is not. And that's where I circle back to the design around the people, around the places, around the processes. We need to be able to communicate a plan that ensures to employees that the inclusiveness that they felt because everybody's in the same situation will continue when hybrid truly emerges and people can get back at the office. And, and to jump on that, back when I was at Microsoft, uh, we had introduced, if you remember, Jordan, the hoteling product back then. So we went from cubicles one day they were gone, we had hoteling, brand new stations, and everybody was in a brouhaha, but they loved it. And then, you know, our uh, leadership at the time in financial services took it to the next level, and we went to what's called Triplex. And the goal there was to take our employees, uh, Scotiabank was the, the group that I led, and actually house them, domicile them right at the customer. And so that was uh, strange and new at the time, but we were very close to the customer. And we're seeing some of our clients now thinking about that trifect way of thinking, which is flexible. But as you've got a very large client, actually housing your thought leaders right there for part of the time is a huge accelerator. So as we think about flexibility, you know, think about you know, equipping the uh, employee properly at home with all the vehicles, stand-up desks, uh, monitors, all of that stuff is, is what they need. And then also tying in, you know, this hoteling environment that you need. But thinking about the personality of the person and how you set them up, you will need things like coffee times. You know, you will need things like special rewards uh, for projects that are given either virtually or, or uh, through Amazon sent to their homes. For example, we on St. Patrick's Day sent everybody, our shared services sent everybody at St. Patrick's Day box with six cans of Guinness and some 
some fun trinkets. And it was hugely received uh, by the team as something that was a break from their day. They actually got out, opened it, and uh, it's like having a live uh, event, but, but virtually. So I think the flexibility going forward will have to be thought out, tied into rewards and recognition, tied out to the world of what you're selling or what service you're doing. And don't be afraid of doing you know, a, a different model where actually maybe perhaps some of your employees are right on site at the customer. I'm seeing that as a trend. We did it back in Microsoft a few years ago or more than 10 years ago, uh, and it worked wonderfully. Uh, next question, uh, Hannah. Sure, we just have one more. So do you see, do you foresee there being disadvantages, Jordan, for people who want to stay working remotely versus people who are eager to get back to the office? Dave, I know you kind of touched on this as well, um, but this person says they've heard of some companies cutting salaries for folks who don't want to go back to the office. Do you think companies compensate, will compensate those people differently? Or can you. rather? This, this is this obviously be be one of those caveats where this is my opinion and not that of Microsoft's etc. But I, my personal belief is those are the employees, the employers that you will see are very quickly in a war for their best people. Um, everything that we're predicated on is designed around in, cre in creating the most inclusive and equal environment that we possibly can for all of our employees regardless of who they are, regardless of where they are, regardless of how and when they're doing their work. So I, I truly believe, and I certainly will be doing so within my own management team, that we should be working hard to create as much of an inclusive environment as we can that actually goes in the opposite direction of what was just described. How are we reconfiguring meeting rooms to make sure that we're aware that, you know, you know we're in a U shape because half the people will be facing a screen and half of the people will be on the screen versus the traditional meeting room. Um, you know, how are we making sure that we're attracting the right talent because people know that we actually embrace employees that will that are working from wherever they might be. Um, I, I could not, I could not uh, believe more that the strategy on that is to continue to be as inclusive and as equal as possible for regardless of where an employee chooses to do their work. I just had another thought on that, uh, and I believe with that uh, 100% Jordan. Some companies, though, are looking at non-essential services, and those uh, services, perhaps it's IT. I mean, we, for example, outsource all of our IT, and it's worked very, very well. Um, and the cost is contained, um, and that is being certainly thought of. I know at Microsoft, uh, when I was there, Jordan, they had outside people as admin assistants. I'm not sure if it's still that way as partners. But your key people, as Jordan said, cutting their wages is a death spiral. That would be just absolutely not the right thing to do. In fact, having uh, people leave the, the number four reason why people leave jobs is money. It's not number one. Um, so, so keep that in mind. But increasing performances or year-end performance bonuses, we do that at our company, is a fun way of getting extra cash to, to your team based on company performance. Um, but certainly you're going to uh, be challenged if you think you can put people at home and pay them less money because they will leave you. Uh, and that's, you know, real challenge because the, the labor pool is shrinking. Back to you, Hannah. Okay, we just have one last question from Don Mitchell. He says, the premise of the innovation world, Communitech, et cetera, was that you needed the personal contact to develop creative solutions. The virtual world just just does not offer that. That seemed to be the recipe for success in the pre-COVID world. Do either of you have any comments on that? Jordan, you're the highest B. You take that one, buddy. <laughs> I, I, it, a very quick answer to it. I know we're over time. It is, I, I think more than ever, we have to challenge those paradigms. We have to think about how we can create new environments and new paradigms where we can still get the best out of our, our employees, the best levels of collaboration, regardless of whether they're all physically in a room or not. I think we've learned, you know, early on in the pandemic, there was, there was a belief that happiness would go way up and productivity would go way down because people were not having to drive into the office and do all that stuff every day, but they wouldn't actually do any work because they didn't have to drive into the office. What we learned over time is it was the exact opposite. If we weren't careful, Productivity goes way up 
and, and happiness went way down because all people did was work. I think somewhere in the middle is where we're landing with hybrid, which is learning that, hey, we need to create an environment that where possible mimic some of the guardrails that existed in the in the physical world, like commuting time that gives you that decompression, like breaks and water coolers, and like thinking about new ways to create collaborative environments so that everyone, regardless of whether they're in the room or not, has access to shared workspaces, they have a similar experience, they can all see the same content. And we truly start to create the, the same seamless experience where, where people can do their best collaborative work from wherever they are. And imagine, by the way, like I, I think about Microsoft, obviously, where I, where I work, you know, I'm in, I'm in Guelph, Mississauga, Toronto, wherever I may be, there's 75, 80,000 Microsoft employees in Seattle. Imagine the kind of power we unlock when we are truly collaborating with our with our folks that are regardless of where they are in the world versus having to get on planes and fly there just to be in a meeting room to be able to do the kind of collaboration that we used to think was necessary. So I, I, I think absolutely we can continue to drive an extreme level of collaboration. We just have to think differently about the tools and processes that we put in place to enable it. And that's Dave, where, anything uh, to add? That's where Mayor Mitchell, all of our government uh, leaders can help us by, you know, getting to 5G, 6G, 7G, whatever it is, they just open the pipes up so we can have faster pipes. And, you know, one law firm that I know of uh, had a meeting just to talk about playoff hockey and uh, as a diversion. And so diversion, virtual coffee breaks scheduled in uh, are water cooler like, but uh, will never replace uh, that person to person touch. I, I believe like, uh, 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 David Solomon, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, that you know the personal touch still is there, where we can have a water cooler, hallway chat, and, and many high people uh, yearn for that. So uh, we'll see what the future holds. But I want to thank you all for, uh, for for joining us today, and and maybe Hannah, you can close off. Sure. So thank you, Jordan and Dave, for your time today. It was a great conversation. And thanks to all who stayed on over time. We will send a follow-up email with a link to the Microsoft Trend Index so you can read it for yourself, as well as a link to complete the behavioral assessment if you haven't yet tried it. But thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Dave and Jordan, once again. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. Bye-bye.